On the 3rd of February, 2022, the world lost a remarkable filmmaker with the passing of Ivan Reitman. The Canadian director, producer, and writer had given us many classics, such as Stripes, Animal House, Twins, and Kindergarten Cop. But to many, his true crowning achievement was Ghostbusters, as not only did he direct a movie, but also gave us a true pop cultural phenomenon, something that has given the world so much joy for nearly 40 years now. But not only did Ivan Reitman direct Ghostbusters, but he also helped to make it the movie that we all know and love. After all, if it wasn't for Ivan Reitman, Ghostbusters would have been this really strange and surreal movie set in the future, where Ghostbusters is a huge branded enterprise, whom can travel into other dimensions and even outer space, zapping monsters with magic wands. So what better way to celebrate Ivan Reitman than to talk about Ghostbusters? But hang on! Wait a minute here! That video already exists! I already made a 10 Things You Didn't Know About Ghostbusters episode. What is this, Minty? Yes, that's true, but there is still so much about Ghostbusters to explore. More information that I didn't even go into in that video. So welcome to 10 more things that you didn't know about Ghostbusters. So if you're watching this video and want to know why I haven't covered other well-known Ghostbuster facts, like why at one stage they were called Ghost Smashers, then check out the other video. So with that, let's look into 10 other things that you may not know about Ghostbusters. Number 10. Columbia Pictures Were Hesitant Once Ivan Reitman and Harold Ramis had done rewrites to Dan Aykroyd's original Ghostbusters script, Reitman took Ghostbusters to Columbia Pictures to see if he can get the studio to produce the movie. After all, they had produced his previous movie, Stripes. He met up with Columbia Pictures executive Frank Price, who although found the script to be funny, also had second doubts, as Ghostbusters was a comedy and comedies back then had a reputation for only making a certain amount of money in the box office, and that the special effects required for Ghostbusters wouldn't cover the cost that the average comedy movie makes. Needless to say, Reitman won Frank Price over, and Frank asked Reitman how much money he'll need to make the movie, where at the top of his head, Reitman said $25 million, on the account that that was triple the budget of his previous as-mentioned movie Stripes. Price agreed on the condition that the movie be completed in 13 months, which automatically put the production under pressure, as they had just over a year to make and complete the movie, and at that stage they had no finalised script, no filming start date, and didn't know yet who to get for the special effects. But Reitman with heart and gusto soldiered on, and Ghostbusters was a hectic gig for the director, as during the shoot he would be filming all day and editing the movie all night, as there was a mad rush to get the movie completed on time. There was just one thing standing in the way of Ghostbusters production, and that was this little guy right here. Number 9. Coke nearly stopped Ghostbusters. It would seem that with Columbia Pictures now backing Ghostbusters, that Ghostbusters was a sure deal, right? Well, not necessarily, as Coca-Cola had a thirst for putting an end to Ghostbusters production. You see, Coke had brought Columbia Pictures on June the 22nd, 1982, for $750 million, in an attempt for the company to expand from the soft drink market and make it into the movie industry, where with Coke, Columbia Pictures made Tootsie, The Karate Kid, and The Big Chill, as well as a few costly flops. When Ghostbusters went into production, Coke wanted to scrap Ghostbusters, as they thought it would be too expensive to make. Columbia executive Frank Price at this stage was fed up with Coca-Cola, so he left Columbia and went to work for Universal Pictures instead. But when he left, he left Ivan Reitman with complete creative control over Ghostbusters. So with that, although Coke wanted Ghostbusters scrapped, he went and made it anyway. 
As far as Coke's involvement with Columbia goes, Coke ended up detaching itself from Columbia Pictures a few years later in 1987. I'm gonna get you a nice fruit basket. I'm gonna miss him. It's a good thing they didn't listen to Coke and make the movie anyway, or otherwise they would have lost millions. What can I say? Get Coke, go broke. Number eight, where's Bill? So Dan Aykroyd's original choice to join him as Ghostbusters was John Belushi and Eddie Murphy. But after Belushi sadly passed away and Murphy chose to star in Beverly Hills Cop instead, Aykroyd had to find new Ghostbusters. And naturally his first choice was Bill Murray, as the two had worked together on Saturday Night Live. And both Harold Ramis and Ivan Reitman were keen to work with Murray, as they had also previously worked with him on Stripes. So Murray was on board to star in Ghostbusters. Well, kind of. He sort of said yes, but didn't really say yes. Yeah, he didn't entirely commit. Him starring in the movie wasn't exactly set in stone. As Ghostbusters production was going forward, people kept asking, where is Bill? And some even questioned, is Bill Murray even going to star in this movie? Dan Aykroyd kept insisting to everyone that Murray will star in Ghostbusters. Don't worry, it will happen. To make matters even more hectic, filming had now started in New York, and there was no Bill Murray. That's because Murray was in France at the time. You see, Murray was trying to get a movie off the ground called The Razor's Edge, which is a movie that he had just filmed in Europe. And it was something of a love project of Murray's, which was to show his serious side as an actor. And Aykroyd had actually arranged for Columbia Pictures to distribute The Razor's Edge if Murray agreed to star in Ghostbusters. And although Murray was in France, supposedly because he was feeling down about his experience with making The Razor's Edge, thankfully he was still true to his word and finally did turn up on set and pretty much ad-libbed his way through the movie, delivering one of the greatest comedic performances in movie history. It's funny because for 20 odd years, Dan Aykroyd had frequently been trying to get a Ghostbusters 3 off the ground, with Bill Murray constantly saying no. Well, this battle of trying to get Murray to suit up as a Ghostbuster started all the way back from day one with the very first movie. Number seven, Winston had a larger role. So in Ghostbusters, Ernie Hudson stars as Winston Zenimore, a new recruit who joins halfway through the film. But although his scenes are limited, Hudson still leaves a lasting impression in the movie and has some truly memorable lines. I have seen that'll turn you white. However, his part in Ghostbusters was originally much larger. In the original script, Zenimore was going to show up on page 23. But in the final script, he doesn't show up until page 63. Winston originally had an entire backstory about him being an Air Force demolition expert. In fact, it wasn't until the night before filming that Hudson got a revised copy of the script, only to see that his part had been drastically cut down. He was told that this was done to expand on Bill Murray's role, to truly utilize Bill Murray's comedic talents. For example, in the famous scene where Peter gets slimed, He slimed me. That was actually meant to be the Winston character who gets slimed. Ah, don't worry Ernie Hudson, we all still love you and think that you gave a terrific performance in Ghostbusters. After all, he says the last line in the movie. I love this town! <laughs> Number 6, Music Magic. So the score of Ghostbusters was composed by Elmer Bernstein, who although spent most of his earlier career scoring more serious movies like The Ten Commandments, in the late 70s and early 80s, he had become the go-to guy for composing comedies, with the legendary composer also scoring Animal House, Airplane, An American Werewolf in London, Stripes, and Trading Places. So it seemed a given that he would score Ghostbusters. And he gave us his Ghostbusters theme. You know that tune that goes da 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 dum dum 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 And as far as he was concerned, that was the official, definitive Ghostbusters theme song. However, later down the track, Ray Parker Jr. gave us the funky and insanely awesome pop song of Ghostbusters where his catchy tune of Who You Gonna Call quickly became the iconic tune associated with Ghostbusters. In reality, Bernstein wasn't a fan of this more pop song version of Ghostbusters. 
In fact, Bernstein wasn't a fan of any of the pop songs heard throughout Ghostbusters, of which quite a few contemporary pop songs are heard throughout the film. Bernstein particularly didn't like the song Magic by Mick Smiley for some reason. When talking about Ray Parker's Ghostbusters song, he said, quote, How can you argue with something like Ghostbusters when it's in the top 10 on the charts? Speaking of the song, Parker Jr. got the idea of how the Ghostbusters song would be when he saw the Ghostbusters commercial that was used in the movie itself, where he felt the Ghostbusters looked like bug exterminators, which made him think of real-life adverts like that, which tended to say lines like, Call us! Of which the line, Who you gonna call, popped into his head. I couldn't help it. It just popped in there. Although there are other claims that he was inspired by the line from a drain company commercial. And supposedly there were somewhere between 50 to 60 alternative Ghostbuster songs that were composed by a variety of artists, but they weren't used in favour of Ray Parker Jr.'s awesome song. Number 5. Doing the special effects like a boss. When it came to doing the special effects of Ghostbusters, the production went to the best of the best when it came to special effects in movies. The George Lucas founded Industrial Light and Magic, whom had been creating movie effects since Star Wars in 1977, and had previously shown that they have what it takes to creating cinematic ghouls two years earlier with Poltergeist. However, Industrial Light and Magic turned Ghostbusters down, saying they were unable to do the effects as they were too busy working on Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. However, one of Industrial Light and Magic's star employees, Richard Edlund, had other ideas. He wanted to leave Industrial Light and Magic and go into business for himself, and he thought that Ghostbusters would be a good place to start. And he would have been the right man for the job. After all, he helped to bring the ghost creatures to life for the as-mentioned poltergeist, and yes, the ghouls in both movies actually do look quite similar. So Edland and several other employees of Industrial Light and Magic left the company, and Ivan Reitman convinced Columbia Pictures and MGM to contribute $5 million to Edland to start his new special effects company, Boss Film Studios. The new effects company were working on the effects of Ghostbusters and 2010 The Year We Make Contact simultaneously. Boss Film Studios' efforts paid off. And after Ghostbusters, the company would create effects for Fright Night, Big Trouble in Little China, Masters of the Universe, and Die Hard. But sadly, Boss Film Studios closed down in 1997, with Starship Troopers being one of the last movies the company had worked on. Number 4. Ivan Reitman wasn't sure about Mr. Stay Puft. So as mentioned, Ivan Reitman contributed to many changes to the original Ghostbusters script. However, one aspect from the original, more outlandish script was the arrival of Mr. Stay Puft, the giant and possibly very delicious marshmallow man who runs amok in New York in the movie's climax. Although it was a bizarre scene from the original script, it still managed to find its way in the final script. The concept of Mr. Stay Puft was that he was a cross between the Michelin Tire Man, the Pillsbury Doughboy, and the Angelus Marshmallow Man, who was a Canadian Marshmallow Man mascot. Aykroyd admitted that when the sailor's hat was added to the character, he found the whole thing to be hilarious. However, one person who was not laughing was Ivan Reitman himself, as he was questioning if having the movie end with a giant marshmallow man was a good idea. He thought that despite the fact that Ghostbusters is a wacky comedy, the Mr. Stay Puft marshmallow man was too much of a leap in logic, even if it is a supernatural caper with ghosts and ghouls. Supposedly, even while filming that scene, he thought to himself, What's happened to my movie? However, his fears were soon laid to rest, as during an early test screening of Ghostbusters, none of the Mr. Stay Puft effects were actually in that cut of the film, except for this one shot. And when that appeared on the screen, the audience gave a mighty cheer and were really excited. So it was then that Reitman felt more comfortable with the now iconic Mr. Stay Puft. And let's face it, it's hard to imagine Ghostbusters without the ghoulish, pesky marshmallow man. Oh, this Mr. Stay Puft is okay, he's a sailor, he's in New York. We get this guy laid, we won't have any trouble. Number three, Ernie Hudson's real life ghost encounter. Ernie Hudson may have played a man who comes face to face with ghosts on the big screen, but it seems that he also met up with terrors beyond the grave in real life too. In the episode of the TV show Celebrity Ghost Stories, Hudson claimed that after the release of Ghostbusters, while promoting the film, he agreed to spend the night in a supposed real life haunted hotel. 
I mean, come on, nothing can be scarier than Gozo, right? The hotel was in East Central Arizona, and during his night at the spooky hotel, it seems that Hudson and his family got more than they bargained for. As that night, Hudson bared witness to ghostly apparitions, bizarre hovering orbs, and strange cold spots. And supposedly, all the other guests who stayed in the hotel that night also experienced some out-of-this-world activity from beyond the grave. All I have to say is that if I ever spend the night at a haunted hotel, I would hope that there's at least a 15% chance that Jack Nicholson won't be chopping the door down with an axe. Otherwise, I'll be expecting a 50% discount. So what do you guys think? Do you believe that Ernie Hudson really did have a ghostly encounter? If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. Number two, deleted scenes. There are many deleted scenes that didn't make it into Ghostbusters, some of which have even surfaced since my last Ghostbusters video. Now thanks to the Ghostbusters DVD from the early 2000s, we were already greeted with some of these deleted scenes, such as the Honeymooners in the hotel suite, Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd playing street bums, Winston suggesting that instead of fighting Goza, they flee to Australia, and Mr. Stay Puff's hat plummeting to the ground after he's been destroyed. But since then, we've learned of more deleted scenes. The most famous of the deleted scenes is a sequence where Ray and Winston visit an old army fort to investigate some paranormal activity. Winston waits outside while Ray goes inside the fort and dresses up in old army uniform, where he lays on a bed in the fort and is approached by a beautiful female ghost. This scene of the lady ghost was actually used in the montage scene in Ghostbusters. Yeah, that scene where it would appear that Ray was going to be doing the sliming this time. By the way, that moment always confused the heck out of me as a kid. The full deleted scene ends with Winston knocking on the door asking if Ray is okay, where Ray replies, Later, man! Suggesting that he was probably having too much fun with this promiscuous poltergeist. The scene was deleted because in that part of the movie the scene was going to be placed in, the story was really starting to move forward, and it was just felt that this would slow everything down. Another scene shows a New York cop trying to give Ecto-1 a parking ticket, where Ecto-1 seems to be scoping the cop out, and then destroys the ticket once it's placed on the windshield. This scene poses so many questions, like does Ecto-1 have a consciousness, and is this artificial intelligence? Another scene sees a possessed Lewis Tully running around the streets of New York, and these scenes were supposedly some of the first scenes to be filmed. In another Lewis being possessed sequence, we see the character being apprehended by a street gang, where Lewis uses his new supernatural powers to make the gang back off. There are actually tons of deleted scenes out there, some of which feature the odd piece of dialogue here and there that wasn't used in the final film. But each time more footage is found, it's the equivalent of finding gold to the Ghostbusters fandom. And there is no doubt in my mind that in later years to come, there will still be more missing scenes being discovered. So before we get to number one, here's a bonus look into my Ghostbusters merch. Spoilers, you're about to see that I really like the real Ghostbusters cartoon. So first up, we got the Ghostbusters VHS tape. This is from its very first VHS release, and it's American, hence its small cardboard case. Here is the Australian VHS release of Ghostbusters 2, and as you can see, we used massive cases. The green cover and red case always had this most profound effect on me as a kid, like this was going to be one insane Ghostbusters adventure. Here is an American VHS release of the real Ghostbusters episode, Knock Knock. Yep, just one episode. It's worth it for the cover art though, that's awesome. But I don't know why just one episode. I don't know, maybe this was like part of some kind of special offer or something. Here's the Australian DVD release for Ghostbusters from the late 90s and early 2000s. And I know that we got different cover art to what the States and the UK got. And this cover also has Winston on it, even though he's sort of tucked away in the background there. Which is nice to see Winston, as he often gets left out of the first Ghostbusters movies posters and cover art. I also like the artwork on the disc of this release too. Look at that, that's awesome. 
Here is the Australian DVD release of Ghostbusters 2. Came out the same time as the other one. Not really much to say, other than they didn't put as much effort into this DVD release as they did the first Ghostbusters movie. Here's the Australian DVD release for the real Ghostbusters. Once again, we got different artwork here. Also, this is the first season of the show, and thus far in Australia, season one is the only real Ghostbusters season to be released on home media. So we really got ripped off in this country. Here's an American release of the entire series of the real Ghostbusters, except that it's not. It's still missing somewhere like 20 to 30 episodes. Apparently due to some copyright issues, not all the episodes can be released on home media. I say come on Sony, fix that up. Let us have an entire release of this show already. Here is a UK DVD of the real Ghostbusters called Adventures in Slime and Space. Even though it doesn't feature the episode where the Ghostbusters go into space, so I don't know how that happened. But this is kind of vital, as it does contain four episodes that aren't in the other box set that I just showed you. So at least it's covering some episodes that you can't get anywhere else. Here we have the DVD releases for the Filmation Ghostbusters. I thought I'll show you them because to me as a kid, they were like the parallel universe version of the other Ghostbusters. What's really weird is that here in Australia, they were released by Universal Pictures. As a kid, I always called the Filmation Ghostbusters the Go Go Ghostbusters because they always said, let's go, let's go. And here we have the Australian DVD release of the Extreme Ghostbusters, which was a sequel series to the real Ghostbusters, which came out in the late 90s, giving Ghostbusters a Generation X twist. This is actually a very underrated series in my opinion, and was quite edgy for its time. Here is the original novelization for the Ghostbusters. Now I'll try to show you the pictures inside, but I have to be very careful as the book is falling apart. And yep, yeah, look, the pages are coming out. I better put it away before the whole book comes undone. Here is a real Ghostbusters comic book, which was released by NOW. However, in the UK, these comic books were actually released by Marvel. And I do really enjoy how colorful they are. And look at that, a poster right in the middle. Here is a real Ghostbusters annual. This is from when I was a really little kid growing up in the UK. Now each year, around about Christmas time, popular children's franchises would release a book in the UK and they were called annuals. And they were full of comics and puzzles and other stories. Now here is a recent graphic novel from IDW, which is a crossover of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the Ghostbusters. I swear this is a crossover I've waited for my whole life. And yes, it may have taken a long time, but we finally got that Ghostbusters and Ninja Turtles crossover that we all deserved. Here we have the Ghostbusters soundtrack on vinyl record. This is an original release, so its age is kind of showing. It's basically full of all the pop songs that are heard in the movie, but it also does feature some music by Elmer Bernstein. Here we have a Ghostbusters lunchbox. Yep, designed to look like one of those old school tin lunchboxes. So now you have something to carry around all your Twinkies in. And it has the Ghostbusters logo on one side, but turn it around to the other side and you get good old Ecto-1. Yep, gotta love Ecto-1. Here's a Ghostbusters cup. Indeed, it's a cup. And it's Ghostbusters. And yes, you can drink out of it. Moving on. Here is a Slimer bottle opener. Yeah, this thing actually looks pretty hideous to be honest. I mean, look at that. Blech. Here we have a Ghostbusters fridge magnet, which I've kept in its packaging. But if you press the circle in the middle, it plays the Ray Parker Jr. song. But that's all I'm gonna play as I don't want a copyright strike. Here we have this really cool prop of the PKE meter. This thing lights up and looks pretty movie accurate. And it's really helpful for cosplaying. So yeah, I really like this thing, it's cool. Here is a Mr. Stay Puffed guy. Some of you may recognize him from seeing him in the background of my videos. I love this thing, it's awesome. It took me a while to figure out what this toy was, but if you look at the back of him, you can see a coin slot. So this is a Mr. Stay Puffed money box. Okay, now we're really getting to business. The real Ghostbusters action figures from Kenner. Now, if you were a kid in the 80s and saw the Ghostbusters movie and wanted action figures of the Ghostbusters, well, you couldn't have them. The only way 
you could have Ghostbusters action figures is if you got the real Ghostbusters ones. But that wasn't a problem as I loved these figures. My only gripe is the Proton Stream was stuck poking out of the gun. So if you had the Ghost Guns on their packs, they still had the streams coming out of them shooting upwards. And it did look kind of silly. Even as a kid, I just feel like the streams should have been retractable. Or at least maybe you could have clipped them on and then taken them off again. But you know, it's just a minor gripe. And of course we have the Ecto-1, who you could put all your real Ghostbusters action figures in. Once again, love this as a kid. And here's how it really looked outside its packaging. I had many Ghostbusting adventures with this thing. Can I also just add that the artwork on all these real Ghostbusters toys are truly amazing? It was almost worth buying these things for the artwork alone. Here we have an action figure of Peter Venkman as he appeared in the movie. I believe this is part of a lineup that came out in 2016. The sculpting is pretty good, but the packaging is starting to look really tired, so if you want to keep it in a box, it's not going to age very well. They did an updated lineup with this new release of action figures. And these ones are way better. And the likenesses are really spot on. Like if you look at these figures close up, you're automatically like, Oh wow, that's Dan Aykroyd. And hey, there's Harold Ramis. I also like the comic pop style artwork on the packaging. It's lots of fun. So if you want action figures that are very accurate to the movie and look great, this lineup from a few years ago is the way to go. What's also special about this lineup is that it even comes with action figures of Dana Barrett and Goza. And unless I'm mistaken, I don't think there had previously been figures of Goza and Dana before. And remember, if this figure asks you if you're a god, you say yes! And last year, we got yet another action figure lineup based on the original Ghostbusters movie. I think it was a tie-in release with Ghostbusters Afterlife. And this time, the figures, although based on the movie, are more cartoonish and childlike. They are lots of fun, but to me, the previous lineup totally wins. And here's my Ghostbusters t-shirt. Every Ghostbusters fan needs to be rocking a Ghostbusters t-shirt to let the world know that Bustin' makes them feel good. And here's my Ghostbuster jumpsuit, which I've been wearing this episode. At first, I had mixed feelings about this jumpsuit due to some of its inaccuracies. Like, why aren't the chest zippers on an angle like they were in the film? And why is the Ghostbusters logo only on one arm? But apparently, that's how it's meant to be. As in the movie, they only have the logo on one arm. So, I'm growing to appreciate this jumpsuit more and more as time goes on, but I do believe I need to sew a name tag into it. The only thing left to show you guys would be if I had a proton pack, but pfft. Yeah, as if I would have one of them. Well, here we are in my video store, and here to show you guys is my Proton Pack. Now, this isn't a movie accurate one. I believe that this is one third of the size of what a real Proton Pack should be, but this thing is still lots of fun, and it lights up when you switch it on. So it's a cool thing to have, which also helps with cosplaying. So that was my Ghostbusters collection. Let's end this countdown. Number one, TV version. There was actually a TV version of Ghostbusters that was shown during the 80s, which replaced some of the movie's more edgy and risque dialogue with some more relaxed, family-friendly dialogue. And I have seen stuff that'll turn you white. So how did this come to be? Well, while filming Ghostbusters, there was kind of several versions being shot simultaneously. Multiple takes where they would call the Ghostbusters Ghost Breakers and Ghost Smashers, due to legal issues of requiring the right to use the title Ghostbusters at the time of filming. And during the filming of these different takes, the cast would ad-lib different versions of the dialogue. So instead of saying, We came, we saw, we kicked its ass, Peter Vakeman said, What a knockabout of pure fun that was. And in this scene where Peter retaliates to Walter Peck's court order threats, You go get a court order, and I'll sue your ass for wrongful prosecution. But in this alternative take, he says this, You go get the court order and I'll sue your funny face for wrongful prosecution. Yeah, is it just me or in that take, Bill Murray just seems less confident. To me, the most fascinating of the alternative takes is the scene where while talking about Walter Peck's, uh, Peck, Vakeman says this. This man has no dick. This is without a doubt one of my favorite lines in the movie. However, in this other version, Peter says this. The man is some kind of rodent, I don't know which. Nowhere near as good as the version we got. It just doesn't have the same comedic impact. Yeah, the one that was used is naughty, but sometimes being edgy and naughty just works better. 
Speaking of edgy jokes, I love this short promo film where Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray are talking about Ghostbusters and trying to entice people to watch it, where Dan Aykroyd says this. And it is PG. I'm fucking telling you, it's PG. <laughs> Love it. I also love Bill Murray's face. You can tell that he was not expecting that and found it to be genuinely funny. It's a funny classic moment for what would become a funny classic movie. And Ghostbusters is a classic. It's a cherished movie that's going to be loved forevermore. And without a doubt is one of the most celebrated movies of all time and one of the most recognisable movies of all time too. And so it's here that I bid farewell to a great and wonderful movie director. Rest in peace Ivan Reitman, thank you for Ghostbusters as well as your other movies. You will be sorely missed. See ya!